Grace and peace to you in the name of our brother Jesus Christ. Today is the end of, is the end of week two for our series on Exodus. So if you've been reading along with the chapters, uh, we're through chapter 10 and coming up on, and the coming week is 11 to 15. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to do the reading so far, don't try and catch up. Just start tomorrow with chapter 11. Okay? The story of God is... The story of God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt is an important one because it is, at heart, the story of the founding of the people of Israel. This is the foundation, the source, the meaning, the touchstone for what touchstone for why the people of Israel are bound to God and how the covenant between God and God's people came about. That's what Exodus is, and it's that covenant, it's that relationship that nurtured Jesus' faith and the faith of his early disciples. In other words, it's the family story. And today we learn about God's mighty acts in freeing the Israelites from slavery. So will you pray with me? Strong and mighty God, great one who is doing what you choose to be doing, give us hearts to receive your strength and wisdom and to live fully and joyfully in response with our eyes open to see you at work in our world. Amen. So last week we finished the Bible reading, hearing, Mos- hearing God tell Moses the divine name as part of a longer conversation about Moses being sent to Pharaoh to demand the release of the Israelites. And eventually God does get through to Moses, and Moses comes out of exile and goes back to Egypt with his wife and children in tow, with his brother Aaron by his side, to talk Pharaoh into something Pharaoh definitely does not want to do, to let go of thousands of slaves, to let them walk away with all their families, with their labor power, and with their valuables. So Moses gets a hearing from Pharaoh, but not exactly the response he was hoping for. Pharaoh gets angry that the Israelites would even ask for such a thing and ups the workload for the Israelites who are already working pretty hard making bricks for the pyramids or some other ginormous civic building. So when the Israelites can't make the same number of bricks that they were making before with all their supplies taken away, they start getting in trouble. They start getting abused by the Egyptian overseers. And it doesn't take long for them to be mad at Moses who started this whole thing, right? So things are worse now because he started stirring up trouble. Not better. And it takes a long time and a lot of damage to Egypt before Pharaoh softens up. So today's Bible reading tells the story of the seventh plague, which is the plague of hail. Before this, there have been six other plagues, ranging from the eerie to the unpleasant, um, turning the Nile into blood, swarms of frogs and gnats and flies, a plague of boils on people and animals, and then finally the death of all the livestock. Although it's interesting because later... um, the livestock get killed again out in the fields. But anyway, uh, Pharaoh has this pattern, right? Moses will come and he'll do the big Charlton Heston thing. He's like, let my people go. And Pharaoh will say, no way, I'm not going to do it. And then Moses will be like, okay then, here's a plague. And then Pharaoh's like, okay, what if we do what you want, but maybe adjust it like this? Like, only your men go out and you have to leave your families and your livestock behind. And Moses will be like, no, that doesn't work. And then Pharaoh will try and hold out for as long as he can. He's like... Like if you're holding an ice cube and you just hold it as long as you can, right? And then finally, um, he says, he can't take it anymore. He's like, okay, do, that's fine. I'll do, do what you want. Just make it stop. And then Moses gets it to stop, whatever it is. And then Pharaoh says, oh, you know what? Never mind. The slaves have to stay. Sorry. And that goes on for ten plagues. And even after the last plague, when Pharaoh finally says, yes, you can go, and the Israelites are walking out the door, and they're out of sight, and they've been gone for a couple days, Pharaoh changes his mind again and sends his army after them to bring him back. Even after ten terrible plagues, he just can't quite let go. And I have to admit that after ten, after these ten plagues, it's hard to imagine who and what is still alive in Egypt. The people and the animals get covered with all kinds of pests. There's a huge cloud of locusts that comes through and eats all the plants later. And in today's reading, the whole region is pummeled by deadly hail that kills any animals or people who are out in the field after the storm strikes, along with destroying two of their four staple crops, right, as we discussed. So here are some of the things I'm wondering about in this story, about plagues and about Pharaoh and about the enslaved Israelites. 
first off, is this a story just built to encourage community organizers? Right? That's what I wonder about. Pharaoh, the story tells us, endures a lot of losses before he's willing to let the Israelites go. So maybe we should expect a little resistance if we're about the work of trying to change and motivate powerful leaders. And maybe not be surprised when the first response to a demand for change is to make things worse, not better. Because what I don't totally understand about Pharaoh is, how much would it really have cost him to do the right thing at the start, right? To, at the very beginning, just let the Israelites go. To be like, you know what? It's not right. We should, you guys can go. Thanks for all your service and dedication. You know, would it have been a hit to his legacy in Egypt? Would it have meant slower road construction? Would it have meant no massive monument to his realm in the form of a pyramid? Would it have meant simple inconvenience? Would he have to limit his expectations of himself, get by with less? Or just a massive blow to the ego, you know? Or is he holding on for fear that his authority with other slaves and workers in Egypt will be cut? We don't know. The story tells us that Pharaoh and his advisors are living well at the expense of the Israelite slaves. What changes in their own lifestyles are they unwilling to accept? What makes it worth the price that the whole country pays? So I just wonder about that. What is he afraid to let go of, really? So then I'm wondering, too, in this story about the workers who are out in the fields when the hailstorm strikes. All they have to do with the oppression of the Israelites, really, is that they work for the guys who are making the decisions. The text kind of treats them like the property of the advisors. If they die in the hailstorm, it's punishment on their owners, their employers. Is it right for God to kill them with a hailstorm when the problem is that their boss didn't believe Moses' warning, not that they themselves were really to blame? Is that right? Sometimes people will make a very broad statement about the Old and the New Testaments in the Bible. They'll say that God in the New Testament is the loving God, and that God in the Old Testament is angry and vengeful. And I would resist that. I would reject that characterization because it way overstates things. There's times when God is very patient and loving and forgiving in the Old Testament, and Jesus can get judgy and angry in the New Testament. But this chapter sure, certainly shows us what I want to call the smiting side of God. Come see the smiting side of God. Anyway, nobody... It's a Sears commercial. All right, anyway. With the creation used not to sustain, not to feed and care, but as a weapon, as a way to destroy and to subdue an enemy. So what kind of God is that? Is that the God that I know? Um, this week I was having a good conversation with some friends who grew up with some church experience, but they're not really active now. And we got off onto a nice thread about how, how wrong Pat Robertson and his ilk are and how frustrating it is to see the sexism, for example, that he likes to promote. And how somehow the crazy things that he says get a ton of publicity. But what I would call Matthew 25 Christians don't get media coverage for doing the things that Jesus calls for in Matthew 25. Things like feeding hungry people or giving thirsty people something to drink or taking care of sick people or visiting people who are grieving and lonely, lost or in prison. Those things rarely go viral in the same way. So in that conversation, I'm happy to throw Pat Robertson under the bus every time, right? Um, but when I come to a passage like this, it's harder for me to just dismiss the Bible and the God who's portrayed in it. I think there could be some redeeming parts to the story, but it's hard to see God acting like this, right? Killing people and animals, eating up all the crops, and just generally devastating a nation, all because of the sins and the stubbornness of the leadership. Should the people suffer because the leadership is bad? Maybe the people are implicated and we just don't see it. What should we do with a story where God is violent? So I don't have a great and perfect answer to that question. In fact, that's pretty much our community conversation question. But one thing I can say is that in this instance, in this story, God decides to take a side. God decides that Pharaoh, in his obstinate refusal to recognize God's power and the demand for the Israelites' freedom, that Pharaoh is deserving of the punishments meted out. It's an epic battle. And maybe like when you watch the latest 
Avengers or Transformers or Iron Man movie, you're not really supposed to worry about the people who are caught in the crossfire, like the ones who get hit by the cars that are flying around, right? The point is that God is really awesome and can kick serious butt. So that's your lesson for the week. God can kick butt, okay? All done, all right? Actually not. That's not the whole lesson. The hope and the heart and the deeper message is in the story is who God is kicking butt for. It's not for the people who are already in power. It's not for the man who is already getting big pyramids built for himself and his relatives. Egypt is a symbol of wealth, of power, and of a hierarchical status quo that rests its foundation on slave labor. And God, when it's time to pick sides, tag teams with the enslaved and the downtrodden. For the ancient Israelites, this story of Exodus, this story of God's defeat of a powerful enemy, was the foundation of their life together as a people. God, they remembered over and over again, is more powerful than Egypt, more powerful than the empires that try to enslave us, more powerful than the people who seem to be in control. God is more powerful than all the systems, all the structures, all the ideologies and isms that seem so locked in place. And apparently what's needed from time to time to take them out and to make room for something new is a hailstorm like you've never seen before. May we remember the power of God and be grateful. Amen.